Lecture 6, Creating a Simplicial Complex from Data. Recall that to create a simplicial complex, we start by adding zero simplices, i.e. zero-dimensional vertices. So our step zero will be to add zero simplices. But in this case, our zero-dimensional points will be data points. In this very simplified case, my data points lie in a two-dimensional plane. Normally, data points are high-dimensional. For example, I may be comparing the expression of thousands of genes in tumor cells to healthy cells using microarray data. Or I might be comparing politicians' voting records. Or I might be comparing the stats of basketball players. These three applications were all published by Loom et al. this past February in Nature's Scientific Reports. I have included a link to their paper on my YouTube site. Since my very simple data is two-dimensional, each point could represent an ordered pair of numbers. For example, I might have the one point one eight, the point one five, and the point two seven. These points could represent actual locations, or each coordinate could represent a particular property. For example, if each point represents a different tumor cell, the first coordinate could represent the expression of the gene coding for the protein ubiquitin hydrolase, while the second coordinate could represent the expression level of a different gene. Normally, one models thousands of genes at once. Thus, each point could have thousands of coordinates where each coordinate represents the expression level of a single gene. The data points, though, do not need to be described by numbers. Often data is described with numbers, but not always. For example, we could have descriptions describing our data points. The data can be in just about any format as long as we have a definition of closeness between the data points. We need an idea of closeness in order to determine when to add an edge between two data points. So if two points are close, we connect them with an edge. But I put quotes around the term close because we don't have to use the standard Euclidean distance. Any idea of closeness that is relevant to your application will do. For example, correlation is often used. We don't even need an exact definition of distance or an exact distance. We just need to know when to connect two vertices with an edge and when we don't want to connect two vertices with an edge. The definition of closeness will depend upon the application. For now, let's assume standard Euclidean distance. So we can measure or calculate the distance between two points to determine if they are close. But we still need to define close. Thus, we will choose a threshold. We will connect a pair of vertices, V and W, with an edge if and only if the distance between these vertices is less than our threshold. But it is not always obvious how to choose the threshold. This problem can be dealt with by using persistence, which we will briefly introduce later in this lecture. For now, let's somewhat arbitrarily choose a distance, say, 1.8 centimeters. So we will connect every pair of vertices if their distance is less than 1.8 centimeters. If the center of these points represent the zero-dimensional vertices, then this pair of vertices has a distance less than 1.8, and so we connect them with an edge. Similarly, this pair of vertices has a distance less than 1.8, so we connect. We also connect here. Uh, there are lots of pairs of vertices that have distance less than 1.8. The distance between this pair of vertices, these two vertices right here, is greater than 1.8, so we do not connect them with an edge. 
continuing to add edges whenever their distance is less than 1.8, we now have a one-dimensional simplicial complex. Note that in our one-dimensional simplicial complex, we have clustered our data into five disjoint connected sets. So this is one way to cluster our data, that is, grouping our data points into disjoint sets based on some definition of similarity. In this case, we have five clusters. We can now add higher dimensional simplices. How we add higher dimensional simplices depends on what kind of simplicial complex we wish to create. The simplest sim simplicial complex from a computational point of view is the Viatoris Rips complex, where we add all possible simplices of dimension greater than one. So, for example, if we have a triangle, so these three edges form a triangle, thus we can add a two simplex. So since we're doing a Viatoris Rips complex, if we can do it, we do it. So if we have a triangle, if we have a triangle, we fill in the triangles. So in this case, I've got my bottom triangle, this side face, this side face, this side face. Well, now I've created, with these four faces, I've created the boundary of a tetrahedron. Well, I'm supposed to add in all possible simplices. If I have the boundary of the tetrahedron, that means I can fill it in and also add the three simplex, the solid tetrahedron. So we fill this in and have the solid tetrahedron. So I always want to add the highest dimensional simplex possible since these four points, since my four points are all close. That means I have all the edges connecting them, which means I have all the triangles connecting th uh, three sums, which also means I have the solid three-dimensional tetrahedron, the three simplex. Similarly, I've got five points that are close to each other. When I have five points that are close to each other, that means I have all the edges between these five points. I also have all the triangles between these five points. Note, I actually have 10 triangles. I've got these two triangles here, this triangle, and this triangle. That was using these four vertices to get those four triangles. And now I can add six more triangles using that all will have this vertex in it. So if I use this vertex plus these two, I'll get a triangle, which I can fill in. If I take this vertex as well as these two vertices, then I can also get a triangle. And then plus four more triangles. So four more triangles, I get a total of 10 triangles. Well, if I've got all these triangles, I will also have the boundaries of a bunch of tetrahedron. And so these four vertices right here will form a tetrahedron. Let me see if I can change the color here to draw in those tetrahedron. So I'll now use blue whenever I'm filling in my tetrahedron. So I had these four vertices, so I can fill that in with a three-dimensional tetrahedron. I've got these four vertices, fill that in. These four vertices, these four vertices, these four vertices. In other words, I have the boundaries of five tetrahedrons, all of which I can fill in with solid three-dimensional uh, three simplices. So now I've added uh, a bunch of tetrahedron, a bunch of three simplices. But I can also add one four simplex. Since I have five points that are close together, if I've got five points that are close together, I can add a four simplex. So I can add the four simplex, V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. 
And I know that its boundary has already been created. Its boundary was the phi tetrahedron obtained by just removing one vertex at a time. So I had the tetrahedron V1 through V4, the tetrahedron V1, V3, V4, V5, etc. So I had all the boundary three dimensional tetrahedrons. So I can also create this four dimensional four simplex. So I now have my uh, via torus rips complex where I've added all possible simplices of dimension greater than one. Note that we can also get the same simplex by adding one dimension at a time. So like we did in the last lecture, we start off with zero simplices. So since we have our data points, we have our step zero. In step one, we add our edges, and we add the edges whenever the points are close. In step two, we add all possible, all possible two simplices. So whenever we have a triangle for all the triangles, we add our two simplices. In step three, we add all possible three simplices. So whenever we have a tetrahedron, whenever we have four points close to each other, We've got the boundary of a tetrahedron formed when we created our two-dimensional simplicial complex with our triangles. We can now fill it in with three simplices. So we have a tetrahedron here. And then remember, we had five additional tetrahedron. Uh, so we could go ahead and fill those in as well. And so now we have a three-dimensional simplicial complex uh, that had our vertices created from step zero, our edges from step one, our triangles from step two, and now our three simplices from step three, our solid tetrahedron. And then in our next step, we add in step four, we add our four simplices. So if five points are close together, we add our four simplex. Note that we can use the vertices to encode a simplex when writing computational software. To encode this complex, I actually only needed five objects. So I only needed actually these five objects to encode this simplex. So for example, if I take a look at this edge here, suppose these are vertices V1 and V2, then as long as you know I have the edge V1 and V2, well, we could only add an edge if we had the vertices. So that implies we also have the vertices V1 and V2. So I only need, so if I store the edge V1, V2, then I know I also have the vertices V1 and the vertex V2. For faster computation, you may want to encode all simplices in memory, but with the via torus rips complex, we actually only need to identify the highest dimensional simplices. So for example, over here, I've got a triangle right here. So that's the highest dimensional simplex that contains these three vertices. So let's call these three vertices V3, V4, and V5. So I can use this set of these three vertices to state that I have this triangle. But if I know I have this triangle, that means I also have all the edges. So I have the edge V3, V4, the edge V4, V5, as well as the edge V3, V5. So the three edges obtained by removing one vertex at a time. And I also, if I have these th this triangle, then I have these three edges. So I also have each of the individual vertices V3, V4, and V5. So if I know I have the triangle, I know I have all subsets. So if I know I have this triangle, I know I have all the subsets, all the edges, as well as all the vertices. And if we want, we can use set notation for the vertices as well. So similarly, I can encode this triangle with V6, V7, V8. And I know all the subsets will also have to be part of the simplicial complex. Similarly, I can encode this three simplex with the vertices V9, V10, V11, and V12. 
and all its subsets, you know, all the faces, all the edges, all the vertices, all its subsets must also be included in the simplicial complex. And finally, I also had my four simplex represented by five vertices, say V13 to V18, and then all subsets of this, say V13, V14, that edge has to be in there. Or the triangle V14, V15, V16. Or the tetrahedron V14, V15, V16, V17. All of them will be subsets. Uh, they'll all be part of our simplicial complex. Again, for faster computation, we might want to in, uh, encode all the simplices in the memory, but in reality, we only need to encode these five because I, if I know I have this simplex, then I also know that I have all its subsets. So if you have a simplex, then you also have all of the subsets of that simplex in your simplicial complex. To reiterate creating our via torus Rips complex, we start with step zero with our zero-dimensional data points, uh, our zero-dimensional vertices. We add one-dimensional edges in our step one, anything that fits our definition of close. And then we add all, possibly all possible simplices of dimension greater than one. So whenever we have n plus one points that are close, we add an n simplex. So if I have five points that are close, I add a four simplex, as well as all its subsets, so all the three simplices, all the two simplices, uh, all the one simplices, etc. If I've got four points that are close, then I add the three simplex, but I also add all its subsets, so all its subset two-dimensional faces, all its edges, all its vertices, so we have all of that in our via torus Rips complex. And note that we get the same simplex by adding uh, one dimension at a time. What if I increase my threshold? So I connected points if and only if their distance was less than 1.8 centimeters. So now let me increase my threshold, let's say, for example, to 2.1 centimeters. So we'll now do 2.1 centimeters. Uh, 2 point, so 2.1 centimeters. Well, with my 2.1 being out here, I would now need to add this edge. So the distance between these two vertices is slightly less than 2.1 centimeters. So if my threshold is now uh, 2.1 centimeters, I would now need to add this edge. With this added edge, note that now I have only four components. Now I have four clusters. So the choice of threshold definitely affects what kind of simplicial complex we get. Unfortunately, it is often unclear what threshold should be, should be chosen. The solution is to use persistence and check all thresholds. We start again by adding our zero-dimensional data points. But now I want to choose a variety of thresholds. So now to indicate my distance, I'm going to use a ball centered around my vertex. So I had a vertex here, and I will use this ball centered around this vertex to represent my threshold, and the threshold will be the diameter of this ball. If the threshold is the diameter of the ball, so my threshold equals to the diameter of my ball. That means if I take these two vertices, since these balls intersect, this radius plus this radius is my diameter. That means that this distance right here is less than my diameter, so it's less than the threshold, which means I would connect these two vertices with an edge. So each of these balls 
has a vertex attached at the center of the ball. And we will connect two vertices if and only if the balls intersect. So this ball here intersects with this ball, so we'll connect these two. The balls for these two vertices intersect, so we connect them. Same thing over here, connect, they intersect. Barely intersect, but they do connect, so we connect them over here. Over here, I've got lots of intersections. I've got these two intersect, these two intersect, these two intersect, these two intersect. I can even see that this point and this point, their balls also intersect as well. So I join these, these ones intersect. So I'm adding, again, lots and lots and lots of edges. So uh, we get the same edges that we got before. Note, however, when I was uh, creating these balls, how I grew them. So let's start again with our zero dimensional points. We can compute the number of clusters for a variety of diameters. So we start off with 17 data points. So if my diameter is zero, so if my diameter equals to zero, then I have 17 distinct clusters. So I'm not clustering any points together, so I've got 17 clusters. Suppose I now increase the diameter, so I'll increase the diameter of my ball, increasing the threshold. And well now I can see that these two balls, they barely intersect, but they do intersect. And so now I join these two balls with an edge, and so now I have clustered these two data points with these small balls into a single cluster. And so I've gone from 17 clusters to now 16 clusters. We can continue to increase our diameter, so increasing our diameter. I can now see that these intersect here, these intersect here, and so thus I now have my one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten clusters. And so now with this radius, I've gone down to ten clusters. So depending upon the radius, I'll have a different number of clusters. We saw before that if I increase my diameter, I'll eventually get to five. And we also saw we got to four. And if I continue to increase my diameter, well, now we can see lots of things intersecting. So we do have, you know, these balls all here intersect. So I've got this, but this one is joined over to the ball corresponding to this one. And these are all joined. Similar, this is going to be connecting to a vertex over here. This will connect over here. These barely intersect, but they do, so I'll also get a couple of things over here. Everything actually does get connected. I don't get, you know, that maybe that many high-dimensional simplices. I do get a few high-dimensional simplices, but I don't fill in every single possible triangle because I'm still not connecting, say, this point over here to this point to that point. Those balls don't intersect, but lots and lots of things do. So eventually I get down to a single complex where I can see that there will be some kind of path using my edges between any pair of vertices. If I continue increasing my diameter, eventually the entire page will be purple, but in either case, we're down to one component. To choose the threshold, one can determine how long a particular number of clusters lasts. For example, for what set of radii do we have exactly five clusters? If we have five clusters for the largest set of radii, then that gives us a good idea where to set the threshold and which simplicial complex best models our data. I have put links to better animations on my uh, YouTube site, which may better illustrate this persistence concept. Next month, we will also talk much more about persistence during the live lectures for this course. This is just a very preliminary introduction. Let's now compare the following two examples. So based on eyesight, how many clusters do you see on the left 
versus how many clusters do you see on the right? Well, I see just one cluster on the left and just one cluster on the right. But for my data on the left, I have a hole in this data. To better see this hole, let's construct its Via Torres Rips complex. So we're going to reconstruct, we will construct the Via Torres Rips complex for the, this set of data on the left. So starting with our zero dimensional data points, our zero simplices, we've now got our step zero. We then in step one add our one dimensional edges. So add our one simplices. And now I can see my hole, so I can see this hole quite clearly. But I do want to add higher dimensional simplices. Well, why do I want to add higher dimensional simplices? Well, because not only do I see this hole, which I'm trying to find, I also see a hole over here. It's not as big, but I see it. And if I'm doing this computationally, the computer is going to see lots and lots of holes. So we need to fill in those holes. And so now we go to creating our via torus rips where we add the highest dimensional simplex we can. So since these three vertices formed were close, they formed a triangle, so we fill it in. These four vertices over here are all close, so we get a lot of faces, but we also get a uh, solid tetrahedron, a three simplex as well. And so now that I see this, I can see that we clearly have a hull. If I also calculate the Via Torres Rips complex for the data points on the right, we don't have a hull. So there's no hull over here, but there is a hull over here. Note, holes can be important in data. Suppose I create advertise, you know, advertising targeting to the average person. Or suppose I create a drug targeted towards the average patient. Well, for the data points on the left, my imaginary average patient is rather far away from real patients. The average imaginary patient is not that close. And so my advertisement or my drug may not be very effective if I'm targeting this non-existent imaginary patient. On the right over here, well, my imaginary average person still doesn't exist, but it's a lot closer to many of the data points. And so it's more likely to have an effect on at least some of the people that you're targeting. So holes can have important meaning. This is a very simplified description of one potential application. We will talk more about real applications during the live lecture portion of this class.